Good evening. Good evening, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, good evening, everyone. Oh, it's, it's way too quiet in here. Good evening, everyone. And I guess I should try in French. Bonsoir. OK, so I got a, little, a few more responses. Um, we are so excited to have you here with us uh, this evening. And for those who are tuning in via the live stream, good afternoon, good evening in the time zone that you're in. I wanted to take a moment to welcome all of you to uh, the IDEAS Conference on the African Debt Crisis. My name is Amara Enya. I am the president of Global Black, which is a transnational advocacy organization. Uh, we do work around the world on issues of concern to Africans and people of African descent. I also serve as the chairwoman for the United Nations International Civil Society Working Group for the Permanent Forum on People of African Descent. And I serve as the policy director for the Movement for Black Lives, which is a US-based organization. But most importantly, I get to be a comrade to many of the individuals sharing the stage tonight, but also that are here for this IDEAS conference on the crisis on African debt. And so it is with that lens in mind that we are here at a very urgent moment on a very urgent topic with specific interventions that are necessary to affect positively the lives of our people particularly on the continent. So this conference has brought together policymakers, academics, scholars, activists, advocates who are working toward this goal. And so we encourage you to share the contents. This is the opening round table, but it goes from the 27th through the 29th. So please share it in your networks. And we're looking forward to uh, the conversation this evening. I have a couple of housekeeping points to share with all of you for ease of participation. So the first is that we do have interpretation uh, services this evening. So if you do require interpretation to French or to English, if you can raise your hand, we have a couple of technicians in the back who will be able to support you. Some of our panelists will be speaking in French uh, and so we want to make sure that this is accessible uh, to everyone and vice versa. So if you, at your table, you'll have a, I was gonna say contraption, but a, this uh, technological equipment, channel one is English and channel two is French. So if you need, and we also have, a oh, channel one is French, the. Ah, uh, three. Toi, en français. Bon. The other is after the session, there will be refreshments outside, just outside the door in that lobby area. So we encourage you to continue any conversations there and to partake uh, in the refreshments that are provided by the conference. Finally, I want to take a moment to thank the organizers of the conference. So this is this conference was put together by Ideas in partnership with Afrodad and the government of Ghana. And so just want to, if we can show our appreciation for the thought and the effort that it took to get us here this week. Finally, I would like to introduce the speakers that we have uh, on the stage. 
we're going to be engaged in a round table. There's no table there, but it will be a round table discussion. And so the idea is we have some questions that we're going to be asking, but our speakers, our panelists will be engaged not just with the audience, but also with each other. These are perhaps complex topics at times. Um, we're not making assumptions about anything that anyone says. And so there may be follow-ups and a bit of discussion. So I just wanted to set the stage for you on how this evening's conversation will go. The title of this session, this opening roundtable, is the recent developments in the CIFA Franc zone and the future of African economic integration. This session is not only a roundtable discussion, but it is the launch of the special issue on the CIFA Franc, which is here in this volume. And one of our speakers will speak more about this volume and why this is, we're really leading into this moment and the special issue that's been, uh, that's been presented. On the stage, we have Her Excellency, former Minister of Culture of the Republic of Mali, Her Excellency Aminata Dramane Traore, We have Dr. Hippolyte Fofak, who's the research associate at Harvard University and a former chief economist at the Africa Export Import Bank or Frexen Bank. We have Mr. Ali Zafar, economic advisor and head of development policy research hub at UNDP. We have Mr. Peter Doyle, the former senior, former senior econ, economist at the International Monetary Fund. And last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Ndongo Sambasila, who's the head of research and policy for the Africa region for International Development Associates and one of the uh, organizers of this conference. So we're going to begin with some opening statements. I'm going to have uh, Mr. Hippolyte come and talk about, talk more about this special issue uh, that's been presented and that's being launched and why it is relevant in this moment and what the implications are for the work that is happening around African integration and these discussions around currency. Good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Good evening. I think I would like to really uh, take this opportunity to really thank IDEA for creating the conditions for us to launch this piece, what we call the special issue on the CFA franc, done by Afrexim Bank under its SIAT, Contemporary Issue on African Trade and Trade Finance Issues which is, I would say, the best policy journal within the continent. But before I get to that, I think I have to start where we should. There are ministries and there are ministers. There are ministers, forever remember, for their exceptional contributions to their countries, for the breadth of their knowledge, an inspiring, almost contagious commitment to share prosperities. I think these ministers are the few who are driven not only by their intellect and historical knowledge, but also, just as importantly, by their drive for result and collective progress toward generalized welfare improvement. You may be wondering, where is he going to? I think when I look back, several decades, two important names come to mind. Henri Malraux, once the Minister of Culture of France, who later become, became the Minister of Culture of France, the only one that we remember 
going back several decades. When I look back several, we have Andre Malro, and we have Her Excellency Aminata Draman Trahore here with us tonight. As in once the Minister of Culture of Mali, she has become the Minister of Culture of Africa. And in fact, the Minister of African Development and Dignity, I should add. What is so exceptional about these two leaders is that the breadth of their knowledge and intellectual radiance, both of which have made them just, not just Minister of Culture, but also historians of the government that they serve. And they ably serve this government. And in the case of Excellency here with us, the renowned historian and encyclopedia of African development, as we've all we've seen over the years, we'll also see tonight through her contributions on this important topic, the CFA Franc. We are so lucky to have with us tonight one of the most brilliant and eclectic leader, a first hour trailblazer, an inspiring leader, her, exception, her excellency, Aminata Draman Traore, who need no introduction, please let our rise to express our appreciation to what she's done over the years, please. And our only Minister of Culture, who has been a household name throughout the continent, around the world, and will forever be remembered for her exceptional commitment and leadership. Thank you very much. Now, coming back to Afraxim Bank, specialist on the CFA Frank, I think I would like to first of all thank Dr. Silla and Zafar here with us tonight, and as Professor Helen Epstein from New York, Teofila Zumahu from France, and Brian Stogist from Buckingham University in the UK, all exceptional scholars professionals who made this special issue possible. Thank you very much. I also like to thank Professor Benedict Orama, the president of the bank, for his intellectual courage and commitment. I think that's very important. The first institution to actually write a special issue on the CFA Frank that many people tend to run away from. During my years in the World Bank, that what I saw. Most issue fundamental to Africa development are often made to be arcane, especially to Africans. Africans are not expected or supposed to be on the driver's seat. It's precisely what we see in the security arena and monetary and especially in the CFA franc area fall within that category. The special issue on the CFA franc provided opportunity for us to raise awareness at the continental level, is not just a francophone issue, especially in the AFCFTA era. It is both a francophone and anglophone issue. The first and the first and special launching in Accra, within the context of IDEA International Conference, it's so important because it broadened the interest and knowledge of one of the most important policy issues confronting the African continent. The special issue also aimed to strengthen African ownership of monetary policy making expertise at a time when monetary sovereignty has become an insurance, an insurance in our increasingly volatile world undergoing a difficult transition toward multipolarity. It's become an insurance in that transitions. At the same time, a lot of statements and hypotheses have been made about the CFA front, including its catalytic role for macroeconomic stability, growth, poverty, and the issue provided the opportunity for us to assess empirically the veracity of this statement. Inflation target has been at the expense of growth, reflecting the immiserous nature of growth, but also and specifically the fact that the rent-seeking nature of the system is such that we tend to have capital flight as a result of that convertibility, which is part of the CFA Frank architecture. But another hypothesis underpinning the CFA Frank 
monetary arrangement is what our good friend Dr. Silas called the myth of the French guarantee of convertibility. I think it's just a myth, as we show in that special issue, which has a cost, unfortunately. But beside our hypothesis, I think the CFA Frank posed several challenges, some of which will be debated tonight by the panel. And I would just like to mention a few of them, the issue of competitiveness and trade growth. When you look at the world today, Africa is 17% of the world population, and yet its share of global trade is 2.75%, less than Holland. It has something to do with competitiveness. And I think the CFA franc area is actually more constrained in that space than the non-CFA franc, as we will see later tonight. But a special issue of CFA franc is also very timely, as our chairperson said. It's important because it's happening at the time where there are a lot of movement within the continent. And we see what is happening, especially in West Africa. We see what is happening within the context of the AFCFTA toward moving toward economic integrations. And as more and more country as part of real independence, as we see in the Sahel regions, the issue of monetary sovereignty becomes even more important. At the same time, there are a lot of issues that were also addressed within the special issue in terms of recommendations, I'd like to just highlight a few of them. For instance, was establishing in the short term, immediately, a bridge between the CFA in West Africa and the CFA in Central Africa, what we call Afrique Occidentale Française and Afrique Equatoriale Française. As in that bridge existed before independence and was suddenly, suddenly collapsed after that. I think we need that to increase the flow between the region. In other words, you can use a CFA franc in Senegal. The moment you arrive in Gabon, it's no longer valid, even though the parity is the same. I think both street commercial bank lending private sector is very important. Now, 10% of GDP, compare that to more than 100% in France, you can see why private sector growth has been lagging within the regions. Establishing swap line between African country central bank and the Fed, for instance, ECB Bank of England or the Bank of China is also very important, will actually address that mythical guarantee, which has not really done that role. And it's essentially pushing country toward the fund when balance of payment crisis occur. Moving away from low inflation target to have the proper trade-off between inflation and growth is also fundamental, as well as, as, well as loosening, monetary, tightening monetary supply rule, to, which is at the root of financial repressions, but also undermine financial intermediations. But Afrexin Bank is also known as a trade finance bank for Africa. And one of the issues that we have within the continent is a trade finance gap, trade financing gap, which has constrained the growth of African trade. We said 3%, less than 3% of total African trade, but intra-African trade is just as low, 15%. I think one issue that we did not cover on this issue that we will cover, essentially looking at the distribution of that trade financing gap across Francophone and Anglophone, and as well as its dynamic, looking at the issue of letters of credit and the issue of networking and correspondent banking, how that play out across the different zone. And finally, I think at the time, the next and most pressing issue for us is to translate this special issue in French. And the task is on the way, and we expect to have it out by May, is that Duxilla? To have it ready by May, and so within the next few weeks, we'll have the French version to essentially leverage, leverage level the knowledge playing field between Anglophone and Francophone country within the continent in this important debate toward ensuring that there's monetary sovereignty and monetary policy becomes a tool for development, but not one that is actually there to finance and port of good. And in the meantime, you could actually access this special issue in the website, in any, in any Google link, by just typing CFA Frank special issue and you will have it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, 
for that. So we definitely encourage you, if you are able to do a search and to obtain a copy of the special issue. Um, again, in May, it will also be translated into French, so it will be accessible, uh, even more broadly accessible. So the conversation that we're about to have, we had a, a pre pre-discussion before starting the session. And it broke down this issue that we're discussing today in basically three broad questions, which I think will help to contextualize the dialogue that we're about to have. And those questions as it relates to the CFA Franc are, is there space to leave the, the CFA Franc as currency? Two, how would that transition be made? In what specific ways could that transition be made? And three, how can that transition happen without things falling apart, without the chaos of what a transition could look like? Or is that even possible? So those are three broad framing questions for the conversation today. And I'm gonna start with Ndongo to get us started on just providing a brief overview of the CFA, CFA franc so that we're at least all on the same page about what it is and why it's central to today's discussion. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Amara. Uh, I will speak in French. <laughs> thank you. Uh, donc, pour commencer, uh, je voudrais remercier uh, Dr. Hippolyte Fofac pour m'avoir uh, associé uh, au numéro spécial sur uh, le franc CFA. Pourquoi c'est important? Parce que le franc CFA est un sujet qui est longtemps resté tabou. Tabou uh, chez les décideurs politiques tabou euh, chez les intellectuels africains et également tabou dans les institutions financières internationales. Et donc, c'est peut-être la première fois qu'on a eu l'opportunité de rassembler des économistes pour parler sérieusement du franc CFA. Et donc, je remercie vraiment euh, Dr. Poïd Fofac pour cette opportunité parce que c'est un document qui a vocation à permettre d'échanger sur cette question qui est importante pour l'avenir de l'intégration économique africaine. Donc, le euh, franc CFA, le, au départ, c'est le franc des colonies françaises d'Afrique, créé le 26 décembre 1945, c'est-à-dire le lendemain de la ratification des accords de Bretton Woods par le Parlement français. Donc, à l'époque, la France était dirigée par un gouvernement provisoire. Et donc, euh, le franc CFA, à l'époque, a été créé secrètement par le Trésor français. Et donc, pourquoi le franc CFA a été créé? Parce qu'à l'époque, l'économie française a été ruinée par la guerre. Et donc, euh, il prévalait ce qu'on appelait l'unité monétaire, c'est-à-dire un empire, une monnaie. Et donc, dans tout l'empire français, pratiquement, c'était la, la, la monnaie française qui circulait, le franc. Et donc, euh, le ministère des Finances français s'est rendu compte que euh, la France a été beaucoup plus détruite que ses colonies. Et donc, il fallait dévaluer le franc. Et donc, la question technique qui se posait, c'est fallait-il avoir euh, le même taux de dévaluation à travers l'Empire ou fallait-il avoir des taux de dévaluation différents? Et donc, le franc CFA est né d'une dévaluation du franc français. Et, mais le taux de dévaluation a été différent à travers l'Empire. Et donc, quand le franc CFA a été créé, le 26 décembre 45, un franc CFA s'est changé contre un franc 70. Trois ans plus tard, le franc français a été dévalué mais pas le franc CFA dans les mêmes proportions. Donc, en 48, un franc CFA s'est changé contre deux francs français. Et donc, dans le travail qui a été fait, on voit que le franc CFA est une monnaie surévaluée. Mais cette surévaluation, elle est chronique. Le franc CFA est né surévalué. Pourquoi? Parce que la France, à l'époque, avait besoin, disons, de se reconstruire, mais de se reconstruire dans un monde qui est dominé par le dollar américain. C'est-à-dire que la France avait besoin d'avoir accès à des matières premières dans sa propre monnaie et pas en dollars. Et la France avait besoin également de récupérer les dollars créés par les surplus commerciaux de ces colonies pour pouvoir avoir un, petit peu, un tout petit peu d'indépendance financière. La France avait également besoin d'avoir accès, disons, à des marchés captifs pour ses exportations. Et donc, le franc CFA a été créé dans ce dessin de permettre à l'économie française de, de se reconstruire. Et donc, quand arrivent les indépendances à partir de 1960, la France a d'une certaine manière verrouillé les indépendances en disant que je vous donne l'indépendance 
à condition que vous signiez un ensemble d'accords. Donc, euh, il, y a, il y aura un contrôle par la France de vos matières premières, de votre système éducatif, euh, du commerce extérieur, euh, des forces armées, etc. Et la monnaie, c'est-à-dire que vous allez rester dans la zone franc. Toutes les devises que vous allez euh, obtenir via le commerce seront centralisées auprès de Paris, auprès du Trésor français. Et donc, ce système qu'on a eu, euh, au départ, jusqu'aux années 70, euh, la banque, les banques centrales étaient euh, euh, installées à Paris. Donc, euh, c'est à partir du milieu des années 70 que on a eu la, la BCAO a été transférée, le siège de la BCAO à Dakar et le siège, disons, euh, de la BEAC, qui s'appelait BCAC, euh, a été transformé à Yaoundé. Et donc, aujourd'hui, nous avons deux francs CFA qui, portent le, euh, qui ont le même acronyme, mais pas la même dénomination, et qui sont utilisés par 200 millions de personnes euh, à travers le continent, donc un Africain sur sept. Et donc, tout à l'heure, euh, Hippolyte a parlé en fait, de l'absence d'intégration et l'absence aussi de croissance économique. On peut le voir, les pays CFA représentent 2,6 de la population mondiale, mais seulement 0,3 du PIB mondial. Ça veut dire presque neuf fois moins. Donc, ça veut dire qu'il y a un problème avec, la, avec le système CFA. Et je, je pense qu'à travers le débat qu'on aura, on pourra revenir sur euh, certains aspects du, du franc CFA. Merci beaucoup. Yeah, so wanted to hand over, there's a microphone over on, on that table too, just for ease, uh, to Her Excellency, uh, Madam Aminata, to talk about from the perspective of just the practical issues with the CFA franc, from your perspective, um, just to kind of share why it's so relevant to, to the conversation today, because you bring us a, a slightly different lens uh, to this work. Merci. Uh, comme Hippolyte, uh, je remercie IDS d'avoir pris cette initiative qui s'inscrit dans un contexte uh, historique particulier. Je crois qu'on ne l'avait pas fait exprès, mais même si on avait fait exprès, ça ne pouvait pas mieux tomber ce débat aujourd'hui en raison et des bouleversements qui sont en cours, non seulement à l'échelle de la planète, mais à l'échelle de notre continent, et plus particulièrement ce qu'on appelle la bande sahélo-sahélienne et l'Afrique de l'Ouest. Merci infiniment à Ndongo Sambasila pour l'effort considérable de clarification des enjeux de cette monnaie, le franc CFA dont il vient de décrire euh, euh, l'origine euh, et la nature surréaliste. C'est tout simplement surréaliste d'être euh, sur un continent comme celui-ci, d'avoir deux zones francs et de prétendre à l'intégration économique, au développement, à la démocratie, à la sécurité, et j'en passe. Comment moi qui ne suis pas... Euh, du même domaine que l'économie et la finance, comment je me suis trouvé dans, cette, dans ce combat. C'est à la suite de la conférence de la Baule, quand François Mitterrand a cru devoir tracer pour l'Afrique une voie, en tout cas une approche de la démocratie, et essentiellement électoraliste, je me suis trouvé, j'étais au Mali. Euh, ce qui s'est passé à cette époque-là, c'est que le, le président malien de l'époque euh, et certains autres qui ont résisté sont tombés parce que euh, on était, comme je l'ai dit, ce n'était pas que du fait de la chute du mur de Berlin, mais aussi parce que les programmes d'ajustement structurel du FMI et de la Banque mondiale avaient créé un terreau qui était favorable à, au changement que les gens voulaient. Donc, on a cru être en démocratie, mais c'était nous n'avions vu que la partie visible de l'iceberg, c'est-à-dire euh, la gouvernance du, du régime d'alors, du général euh, Moussa Traoré, et les, les difficultés liées aux conditions de vie des populations. 
c'est là que je me suis rendu compte que ce qui est dont il est question ici, l'architecture financière internationale pèse considérablement sur, les des, sur le destin des peuples sans qu'elle soit dans le débat. Il n'y a pas de débat sur ce qui se passe au sein de ces institutions. Il n'y a pas de débat de fond sur la monnaie. Il n'en est même pas question. Ça, ça reste une question d'initié. Et pourtant, et pourtant, les prix des matières premières, les prêts qui sont contractés par-dessus la tête des populations, les conditionnalités, et surtout, pour et, relier tout ça avec les événements les plus récents qui sont en cours, qui ont bouleversé le Sahel et l'Afrique de l'Ouest et qui sont en cours. Et il se trouve que la question de la monnaie revient sans arrêt. Euh, pour faire court, comme vous le savez, et les trois pays paria aujourd'hui, c'est-à-dire le Mali, le Burkina Faso et le Niger, et qui sont sous des régimes gouvernés par des militaires, et qui sont sous pression parce que la communauté internationale prétend qu'il faut absolument aller vers des élections pour mettre en place un ordre constitutionnel normal. Et ces pays se sont mis ensemble et ont créé, vous le savez, l'Alliance des États du Sahel. Mais l'une des questions centrales qui revient sans, sans arrêt est précisément celle de la monnaie. Que vont-ils faire, faire s'ils s'isolent en sortant du franc CFA et étant entendu qu'en face, ils ont affaire à cette organisation sous-régionale inféodée à la France et que j'appelle souvent qui est la CDAO, une sorte de cheval de Troie de la France. Ce qui caractérise la CDAO et qui constitue justement un, un, un problème majeur, c'est... Quand on me dit qu'est-ce que c'est que la CDAO, il me vient à l'esprit deux choses. Premièrement, le modèle de développement est, qui est à l'œuvre au niveau de ces pays, dont certains ne sont pas de, de la zone CFA, c'est un modèle de développement économique qui est à l'avantage des entreprises étrangères. Il ne peut pas y avoir d'intégration économique possible au niveau de la zone CFA. Nous n'avons pas d'industrie. La question de l'industrialisation de l'Afrique est au cœur de ce débat. Et si débat il y a, pour l'instant, vous vous rendez tous compte, si vous suivez les événements politiques dans nos pays, qu'il est surtout question du calendrier électoral, du profil des, des candidats, et puis des guerres qui s'en suivent. Mais il n'est pas question d'économie, ni d'industrialisation, ni de ce dont les peuples veulent vivre. Tout se passe par-dessus par de par la tête des populations. Donc, l'intégration économique, la, la CDAO n'est pas une organisation qui a vocation d'intégrer nos économies, puisque sans industrie, tout, tous les milieux d'affaires de cette zone économique, qui est, dont une partie travaille avec le franc CFA, sont en train de travailler pour les industries, les transnationales, les multinationales. C'est une, une région, c'est une communauté qui permet à d'autres de s'enrichir au détriment des peuples d'Afrique, de la zone concernée. La deuxième illusion, bien entendu, est, en plus de celle du modèle économique, c'est le modèle et le système politique lui-même. Et c'est pour ça que certaines personnes, dont notre ami Demba Moussa, appellent et parlent essentiellement de, de syndicats de chefs d'État. Syndicats de chefs d'État qui croient au même modèle, dur comme fer, ils sont tous persuadés qu'il n'y a pas d'issue à ce modèle économique qui consiste à importer, à vendre et à s'inscrire dans un système qui ne nous permet pas de vivre de, de nos richesses. Je ne vais pas être plus long, mais je veux juste dire que eh, nous avons une opportunité aujourd'hui et dans les jours qui viennent, et eh, d'aller plus loin dans le débat sur quelle architecture est financière internationale, et si, étant donné que le capital financier est le nerf de la guerre. Je me dis souvent que le président français, François Hollande, qui est en campagne, avait dit que la finance est son adversaire. Si, la, si François Hollande avait tenu cette promesse, il ne serait pas entré en guerre au Mali 
parce qu'il n'était pas venu pour sauver le Mali. Il est venu pour contribuer à repositionner la France dans son précaré. Donc, le capital financier est essentiel. Le capital financier n'est pas dans le débat. Mais il est aujourd'hui, le contexte de basculement du monde, de la question de, du dollar, de la dédollarisation, les financiers sont là pour et attester que ce dont il est question aujourd'hui ici, c'est une question de vie ou de mort pour l'immense majorité des populations qui utilisent une monnaie qui, plus on avance, plus elle les appauvrit. Thank you so much for, the, for that powerful statement um, and further setting the tone for this conversation. I wanted to go to uh, Mr. Ali Zafar to talk about, um, from your perspective, um, to kind of take us a little bit into the mechanics of the, of the CFA franc and, and related to what we've heard now from Dongo, from Mr. Hippolyte and from Madam Chari. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you to Ideas and Ndongo for inviting me to this illustrious event. Thank to Hippolyte for FAC for advancing this special issue. Um, and I'm, I'm going to ask if you can speak a little bit louder. Is it, is it OK? OK, better. better. OK, great. Listen, I want to make three points today on this opening. One is that, you know, I'm somebody who is outside the CFA franc zone. I'm somebody who has not been um, kind of one of the parties in this, in this debate, right? But when I look at the CFA franc zone as a neutral observer, um, it's an anomalous history that in a world of decolonization, of monetary independence, the franc zone has persisted for more than 70 years in its, in its form, and only recently are we seeing the tensions. Um, the, the institutional architecture of the Frank Zone is a political decision based on keeping a, um, a, a peg um, to the, 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 the euro for many, many years. And there's a bunch of rules in the Frank Zone. I won't get into the technical details, but it, it's the fixed peg, it's the operations account, it's the surrendering of reserves managed by the French Treasury, it's the very tight rules on fiscal and monetary policy. One of the um, um, Argentinian reviewers of my book on the CFA Frank Zone said, it's mission impossible. It's like trying to run a marathon with a refrigerator on your back. You lose independent monetary policy, you lose independent fiscal policy. So that's the first point is the anomaly. Even Ghana, Nigeria, India, they cut the link between with the, with the English pound back in 1960s. Why has this zone persisted? My second point I wanted to make is on GDP growth, right? Who does the franc zone benefit? Um, all the economic evidence shows that this part of the world is falling behind. It's falling behind in per capita income. It's falling behind in private investment. It's falling behind in human development. This compared to any other part of the world. Now, I'm, there are countries in Africa that are not in the franc zone that are not doing well, but the best performers in Africa Kenya, Mauritius, Ghana, many of the performers have, have um, had a much more modern kind of macroeconomic architecture. So um, the, the, the empirics are quite clear. You know, um, the opponents, the defenders of the Frank Zone talk about stability. And you only have to look at the Sahel, you have to look at Senegal, you have to look at the turmoil that's happening in the Frank zone and the, the, the lack of development, the, the, the recalcitrant poverty to realize that this is not working. And my third point I wanted to say um, is that we are living in a new era. 
We are living in an era of shocks, shocks, and shocks. COVID, Ukraine, Gaza, climate change. When you, as a macroeconomist, want to deal with shocks, you have to use the full arsenal of fiscal and monetary policies to address those shocks. And, um, it, it, and, and not only the sovereignty, but also the ability of policymakers, the decisions in other parts of the world are controlling what happens in the Frank zone. The Frank zone needs to have decisions that are made in the Frank zone for the people of the Frank zone. So in a nutshell, I want to say, I am very excited to be here and I'm excited to participate in this debate and share my deep, deep concerns about the Frank zone and suggest ways to exit in a good way. Thank you. Thank you for that perspective and kind of zooming out and giving some, offering us a lens as an observer um, and in comparison to some of the other countries that you named. Actually, so I wanted to turn to Peter Doyle and the question on mechanics was actually designed for you. And this question of austerity and the CFA franc and the mechanics of this, the mechanics of this currency. Cause, so can you talk about the IMF role and the mechanics of the CFA franc? Okay, thank you very much to one and all for having me. Um, of, the, of the three questions that we began with the session, which were, is there a case to leave the CFA franc? If you exit, what do you exit to? How can you ensure that the transition doesn't go wrong? In my opening remarks now, I just want to address the first of those questions, but I'm sure you will not be surprised that I have a rich set of views about the other two as well, which may come up in, in the discussion. So, my position, to make clear from the start, is that leaving the CFA franc will be hard, but it may be wise. It will be hard, but it may be wise. Let me talk about that. Exit from a long enduring currency union, as Niger, Bikuna Faso, and Mali proposed from the CFA zone, is not to be undertaken lightly. Transition creates risks for both exiters and remainers. Exiters' chosen monetary regimes may prove elusive, and better solutions than exit may get overlooked. Furthermore, while Tunisia, Algeria, Mauritania, and Madagascar successfully exited French money, the context was Bretton Woods. Hence, comprehensive capital controls, strong international support, notably from the US for decolonization, and symbolic peg to peg rather than substantive shifts propitious conditions which no longer apply. Nevertheless, exit is far from unthinkable and the three within it has long far, far fallen short of its best peers on GDP per capita growth. Deep security and governance challenges have already so elevated risks that additional from currency transition may be minimal. And the profound sense of the currency union's illegitimacy constitutes a permanent risk of collapse, despite its endurance to date. So the question is, how do these issues stack up in the case of the three who are considering exit right now? Well, Pegged to the euro, the CFA franc has a hard case to answer, some of it we've just heard. Let me elaborate. Alongside low inflation of about 3% since 1990, up to the recent surge, the CFA blocks annual growth in real GDP per capita between 1990 and 2019, so the last 30 years, reported by the latest IMF WIO, 
was just 0.7%. That is fully 2.2 percentage points below its best performing peers at its level of GDP per capita. Over three decades, that differential yields huge income shortfalls reflected in jihadism, coups, and small boats flooding across the Mediterranean. But in understanding the issue, consider the contrast with Eswatini in Southern Africa, which like the three, has also operated in a monetary union, the RAND monetary area. Its inflation averaged not three, but 7% between 1990 and 2019. And from parity with the three in the early 1960s, Eswatini's real GDP per capita is now five times theirs, five. Therefore, there is nothing inherently growth hostile in membership of a monetary union. Particulars and practice matter. So, are the different currency arrangement specifics responsible for that huge real income divergence? Well, beyond average inflation, a key policy distinction between the CFA zone and Eswatini is fiscal. Whereas Eswatini matched the primary deficits of its best peers at its level of GDP per capita over the last 30 years, and so grew at their high rates, the CFA zone as a whole sustained primary balances nearly two percentage points of GDP on average tighter than its best peers, repressing its growth. As a block, and this comes to the role of the IMF, as a block, it was forced to do so, to run these excessively tight primary balances, because the debt relief proffered under HIPIC was grossly inadequate. They had debt relief, not nearly enough debt relief, so they had to run these incredibly high primary surpluses to sustain debt at the expense of growth. So, while the CFA income shortfall is largely due to re excessively restrictive fiscal policy, the inflation differential with Eswatini and other evidence confirms that the currency arrangement was nevertheless also an aggravating factor. But given that creditors are not yet ready to extend further debt relief to allow the CFA to set growth optimizing fiscal policies now, policymakers there are forced to look to secondary sources of growth, including currency reform, or to go on resigned to their stagnant, insecure fates. And the three are evidently not minded to do that. All three recently mounted coups to displace governments, which however formerly democratically credentialed, have been unable or unwilling, despite mineral resources, to deliver shared prosperity or to defeat jihadism. And these new military leaders, having initially received a very negative response from the region, have seen that response now dramatically turn around. And in that context, they have now proposed a study of a new common currency for themselves to express their collective sovereignty. The question is, which will come up in discussion, are they wise to do so? And I've already given you my answer to that. Thank you, Peter, for those opening remarks and for leaving us um, with that question. So I want to turn it over to all of 
the panelists and also to ask if tech can support with perhaps uh, an additional microphone just for ease of communication amongst the panelists. And so this, this first question that kind of builds on that last point is about the CF, CFA franc and monetary sovereignty. So the CFA franc and monetary sovereignty and development strategy, is there compatibility or is it an impossible association? So we'll start there. No, thank you very much for that question. And um, I think we begin to actually get some answer to those questions. If you look at um, the growth rate that have been mentioned, or the growth differential between CFA country and non-CFA countries, I think Ali uh, and Peter actually talked about those as well as um, um, Dr. Silla. So I think in terms of looking at the growth and per capita income, we see the gap, but there, are, there is a fundamental problems. And um, looking at that compatibility, I think the minister mentioned the issue of industrializations. One of the key constraints to industrialization within the African continent is actually link to that financial architecture, whereby in some countries, they're able to deploy large scale resources. Just look at what is happening now in terms of the US, China, and the EU, in terms of subsidies to actually boost the energy transition toward the e-battery, electric vehicle, and so forth. We're talking about trillions of dollars actually injected in the economy overnight. And where debt level are in the trillions, I mean, look at the US, $34 trillion. They are still deploying those resources. And most countries across the continent, even more so the CFA franc, are constrained on that side, as mentioned by my colleague on the panel. So that constraint on the fiscal side, constraint on the monetary side, because on the main criticism of the IMF role in this, I've written about this, is that they've actually insisted on intertemporal fiscal balance, where we should be going for a big push, allow large deficit in the short term, if it can be used to actually support industrializations and structural transformation, which will then guarantee fiscal sustainability and debt sustainability in the long term. That, those options cannot be achieved under that intertemporal fiscal balance that we see as a major constraint within the CFA space. And yet, yet, that transformation is what we need within the African continent, in part because without that, Africa will be forever locked under what we call the colonial development of resource extractions which comes with excessive exposure to adverse term of trade shocks, which regularly will send country to the IMF and the World Bank for balance of payment support. And it's been a cycle, a never ending cycle, which is in the CFA space is aggravated by the absence of flexibility on the monetary side, like a caution against risk, which allow the exchange rate to actually vary adjusted according to domestic adjustment. And so you have no visibility on the fiscal side, no visibility, no flexibility on the monetary side. You combine that to set the country on a long-term path of really austerity and constraint to growth and transformations. Do any of you want to respond to some of the assertions uh, that, that we've made? Yes, thank you. I just wanted to complement what Hippolyte had said with two points, right? <laughs> it's very unusual for very poor country to be anchored to one of the world's most expensive currencies. What does that mean in a day-to-day -day practical thing? The, the 
BCAO and the BEAC have to follow the interest rate policy of the European Central Bank. Are the shocks that Togo and Burkina facing the same as the shocks that Germany and France are facing? So um, you have that problem. Two is you have an overvalued currency. So basically the CFA franc by design is, is a tax on exports and a subsidy on imports. So these countries are going to be perpetually importing. You also have tight restrictions on money supply, on financial intermediation. So imagine you have to walk like this all day. That's the CFA franc in reality. And the fiscal board, Peter and Hippolyte have said, so I won't get into that, but it's quite clear. But I want to add one other point, political economy, right? The franc zone is one of the most uncompetitive parts of the world. Why? You have oligopolies, you have banking cartels, you have transport mafias. And because of this arrangement, and you have what uh, Her Excellency talked about, uh, the kind of behavior from the outside multinationals, you don't have competition. New emerging um, companies cannot come up with the finance, cannot come up with the logistics, a, a cost. And so the CFA franc is going, I hate to say this because I was hoping it's not true, is going to keep these countries poor, I believe. Thank you. Yes, I also want to. I want to uh, piggyback on um, Hippolyte's thing because he and I clearly are in agreement on the importance of the fiscal side of this analysis. That a fundamental failure and reason for the CFA franc's weakness over 30, 40 years is excessively tight fiscal policy. Let me say make two additional remarks about that. One is that there is a very common presumption that a deficit equals irresponsible. To do a bit of advertising, I'm going to present a paper on Friday morning which says not deficit equals irresponsible. And I'm going to show the hard evidence of Hippolyte's claim that if you uh, run deficit properly in the way that Eswatini did, the growth implications can be absolutely enormous over time. But to reiterate, one of the key reasons why the CFA franc zone has not run the kind of deficits that Eswatini did, and hence has not got Eswatini's type growth, is because of the debt. And the point I want to make in this is that there are plenty of folk in Paris who will throw up their hands in horror at the notion that their precious CFA franc zone may fall apart and they may lose their precious French franc. One way to leverage this discussion with people like that is to say, if you want to keep the French franc zone going, give proper debt relief. Take away the fiscal constraint if you want so badly to keep the CFA franc zone. That's a message to address in France. Because what this region, I think, needs more than anything else is an efficient form and an, a sufficient form of debt relief. Maybe uh, three quick points. Um, the first about the, the debt in the CFA franc zone. This is something structural and um, linked to is the way the CFA franc was designed. If you take the case of the eight countries in the West African Monetary Union, they have been running chronic trade and current account deficits for six decades. Uh, generally in Latin America, when you see that countries have been experiencing, you know, uh, decades or I mean, you know, let's say years of current account deficits, you would see that the currency would depreciate. But here you have six decades of current account deficits and you have the fixed pack. How could you do that? You could do that by saying that there is no credit in, in, the, in, in the economy, the first thing. The second thing, you have to somehow do your best to attract foreign finance to accumulate the reserves you need. So that means the kind of growth you could have 
is a growth that is you know, triggered by you know, foreign finance. That's the only way you could maintain this fixed pack with you know, this current account deficit. And the second thing is that why you have this, this euro pack, it's not, uh, it's not due to economics or any economic reasoning, it's a political. It's a political in the sense that France says to these countries, well, uh, I, would, I will guarantee the uh, sustainability of this pack. And that means what? Uh, if your central bank ever needs uh, loans, loans so that you could face temporary balance of payment problems, I am here, the French treasury. But this should be the role of the IMF. So uh, from 1960 to now, there were only, uh, let's say, a few years, let's say 1980s, when the international debt crisis started, that the French uh, activated their so-called guarantee. That means uh, allowed you know, uh, the central banks to have access to loans from the French treasury. But they allowed that to facilitate you know, the repatriation of profits and capital from the French, from the French companies. You see? That's the second point. And that means that uh, this pact is due to the fact that the French say, I could only provide loans in euros. So as long as you accept this guarantee, you have to accept this pact. And if you see the case of the countries in Central, uh, Central Africa, most of them are oil exporters and uh, their trade is not denominated in euro, most of it. I mean, most, I mean at least 80% is not in denominated in euro. So why would oil exporting countries back to the euro? There is no country across the world uh, exporting oil or gas that back to the EU. So that means this is a political, you know, constraint, not, not you know, something, you know, deriving from economic reasoning. And the last point is that the IMF is complicit in that, in the sense that sometimes they made, you know, reports about the West African Monetary Union, but they would be complacent saying that, well, the currency is overvalued, it's inimicable to growth, agricultural growth, etc. but you have the French guarantee. That's what the IMF says when it comes to these countries. Are, for other countries, they will say you have to devalue, devalue the currency, you have to operate on you know, more you know, flexible regimes, et cetera. And the best case of the IMF's complicity is that in 1994, the devaluation of the CFA franc by 50%. Uh, there have been technical studies at the IMF showing that the rate of overvaluation uh, differed across countries, and that was normal. But they said we have to have a harsh devaluation to uh, cut off any speculation for future devaluation, you see. But, you know, the thing is, normally, all these countries should have issued their own currency and get rid of the France zone at that time. Because why would you impose 50% rate of devaluation to countries, you know, uh, who didn't need that? But the thing is, it was the only way to maintain the France zone. And uh, France and IMF, you know, were in tandem to impose that because you, we all know that the France, France has, you know, a strong power within the international financial institutions and, and especially the, the, the IMF. I wanted to add uh, one more point. Maybe you should. No, no, no. No, no, no. No, no, no. No, no, no. No, no, débattu ici. L'organisation s'appelle IDL et c'est la bataille des idées qu'il faut engager maintenant pour être à l'abri et des temps de malheur, qu'il s'agisse des guerres au Sahel, toutes ces guerres, les migrations, le climat. Et on est au cœur d'un paradigme de développement et de relations on appelle ça Global South et, et l'Occident, mais on peut ne pas appeler ça comme ça. Les problèmes sont les mêmes partout. On est, tous les peuples sont confrontés au même drame lié à la question, au, lié au fait que l'argent, c'est le nerf de la guerre. Donc, et cette question n'est pas étrangère à tout ce qui se passe aujourd'hui. Moi, je dis si la France prétend qu'il faut mettre les pays côtiers à l'abri du terrorisme. Ce n'est pas parce que les terroristes se déplacent du Moyen-Orient au Sahel et, et en Afrique subsaharienne d'une manière générale, c'est parce que le terreau est de toutes ces révoltes, le terreau de tous ces phénomènes de destruction de nos sociétés et des écosystèmes, c'est un modèle de développement et sous la coupe 
de ce qu'on appelle la communauté internationale, quand tu parles du FMI, de la Banque mondiale, de, de la France et tout ça, ils soufflent tous dans la même trompette. Ils savent très bien ce qu'ils sont en train de faire dans les, au niveau des relations avec les pays dominés. Donc, moi, je me dis, et à partir de ce stade, au point où nous en sommes dans la destruction des relations entre eux et nous, des, il faut tout simplement et populariser, j'allais dire démocratiser ce, dé, ce débat, que ça ne soit plus et, une affaire d'initiés ou de, de, de spécialistes qui parlent toujours entre eux, quelle monnaie, qu'est-ce qu'on va faire si la monnaie est une question fondamentale et qui doit être inscrite au cœur du et de la démocratie, l'occasion le, le, et le, disons, le contexte historique actuel s'y prête. S'agissant des de, 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 de trois pays du Sahel, comme j'ai dit, qui sont honnis, stigmatisés, acculés, c'est la question. Tout le monde dit qu'est-ce que vous allez faire, comment ils vont faire pour survivre en restant entre eux parce qu'on ne leur fera pas de cadeau. La question se pose à propos du Sénégal aujourd'hui. Que va faire le Sénégal Est-ce que le Sénégal reste dans le CFA ou pas Nous n'allons pas laisser les Sénégalais en débattre entre eux. C'est une question qui nous concerne tous. Et moi, j'aimerais bien, en tout cas, si ce n'est pas dans le cadre de cet espace, que les jours qui viennent, nous puissions voir clair dans les stratégies et les instruments dont nous devons nous, et, 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 nous doter et pour desserrer les taux. Quoi. Thank you. I would like to come back to your questions again in light of what I've heard. I think two points. And going back to Dr. Silas on IMF complicity, it's quite remarkable that the IMF responsibility among many others is really exchange rate management. And when you read a report, there is a strong move toward flexible exchange rate. And historically, the number of countries in the Bretton Woods moving toward flexibility has been increasing continuously. I think now it's more than 80, 90% of countries on, on flexible exchange rate regime. And somehow the CFA has been known for its remarkable stability under that fixed exchange rate, despite all the constraints. And part of the fact that I am a recommendation and preference is for more flexibility. The second point on your question on development, and is it anomaly or is it compatible? I think Her Excellency mentioned the issue of major constraint on that industrialization space. But one thing I'd like to add is that when I look at the FDI data recently, I was shocked to realize that Singapore, that city state, received more FDI, $67 billion, than the whole of Africa, including North Africa, for the two billions. One issue, one constraint to that is the fact that we simply do not have the right infrastructure, whether physical, digital or even human capital attract that investment which is needed to respond to your industrializations. And the conditions are just not there because of that, the tightness of the fiscal space that Peter mentioned earlier. And we have to loosen that fiscal space to build the infrastructure that will be required to industrialize, to crowd in private capital. Thank you. Oh, yes, go ahead. Yeah. I just wanted to add one thing. One of the things about the, the CFA debate is the narrative. The narrative has been controlled from the outside and from the elites inside. And the conventional story was the CFA Frank zone is stable. The CFA Frank zone has low inflation. In, and the story was that the African continent is in chaos, but the CFA Frank zone is stable. That narrative, every new researcher in London or Paris is telling that story. The reality is that narrative is false. 
It's a zone in deep crisis. We have tried to change that narrative in our Africa Exim Bank and to show that some of the political turmoil is due to a currency arrangement that just does not work for the people. So it's a narrative framing issue that we are also combating. Thank you. I think that's a really important point, actually, to emphasize is the role that narrative plays in driving policy decisions, also in manufacturing consent for policy decisions. And it's something that if we're not careful, because we talk so much about framing and how things are framed, the those who may not have the interests of the people in mind have expertly determined how to use narrative in ways that are able to advance their agenda. And I think, Dr. Fofak, you've mentioned something similar in one of your writings around the perception gap or the perception narrative of African countries uh, when considering their suitability for investment or their suitability for capital and how the narrative about African countries has a very tangible impact on the amount of capital that is, that is directed toward those countries. So this, the importance of that of, of narrative to the entire discussion, I think, can't be overstated because no matter what we say in the policy space, if the narrative is saying something else and it is leading people in, a, in another direction, we won't be able to, to achieve the transformation that we're pushing for. Peter. Yes, can I, can I leverage off that narrative point and also raise a few issues now about the transition, how to issues that arise in making a transition actually work or not fall apart. So on the narrative side, if you uh, start talking in international financial circles about leaving the CFA franc, what I call currency scolds who are averse to any tampering with French governance immediately squawk and flutter. It's not just that they exaggerate the stability and the benefits of stability. The narrative point they miss also is the large number of independent monetary success stories across Africa. And they ignore that and they anticipate nothing but Zimbabwean style disorder. So they're ignoring a good record across large swathes of the continent. They're not just understating the problems of the CFA franc. So rather than accept such knee-jerk dismissal of a call for currency reform, it's better by far to echo the effort in the United Kingdom after its 1992 forced exit from the European exchange rate mechanism to consider how and when new and better currency arrangements might actually be made to work. To actually turn discussion to a technical set of issues about how, what to do to make alternative arrangements work. And as in the United Kingdom back then, the prime lever for success in that endeavor, in adverse circumstances as now prevail, is the evident need for and the authorities' manifest determination to turn their country's long-standing misfortunes around. The authorities are now serious about success. That's what you, we can leverage. So what is required? What issues arise in the transition which they need to address? Let me mention just a few of them. Well, Given immediate external financing constraints in the three, that's Burkina Faso, Mali, and Niger, and capital outflows, the transition to any prospective replacement monetary regime will have to be anchored by securing the budgets and an adequate stock of international reserves, thus avoiding fiscal dominance and critically, prior one-way bet devaluation speculation. Those are the two traps you can fall into if you mismanage the transition. 
To avoid those two traps, that will require simultaneous permanent containment of the security problems in those three countries. It will require resolution of governance uncertainties in them. And it will require agreement on a split of the BCEO balance sheet between the levers and the remainers. And how should the potential levers conduct themselves in the meantime while they are working towards those goals in the transition? In the transition, they should retain use of the CFA franc. Don't have some intermediate step. With any unresolved short-term fiscal financing issues minimized and where they arise addressed via arrears on external debt. They should not be accumulating arrears to domestic creditors. If the BCEO withholds lender of last resort facilities in this interim, then the three should impose controls on withdrawals of deposits from banks. And that should be aimed to reconcile ordinary business transactions with banking stability. And the last key thing I want a message not to get lost during this transitional phase is efforts to strengthen medium term fiscal revenue, including transparent resets to mineral royalty contracts should take high priority. So the task is to avoid fiscal dominance arising as an issue and is to avoid one-way bet speculation on the currency. And I've laid out a number of steps which would be required to avoid those traps. So I want to give an opportunity for a direct response from the uh, panelists to what you've proposed and some thoughts that you have, and then we will um, perhaps take some comments from the audience. Thank you very much. I think um, it is very important for us to think in dynamic terms as we look at this transitional arrangement. I say this because where we are, there are leverages that the continent has not really been able to deploy to achieve not only fiscal, but also debt sustainability. And it's quite remarkable if you take Nigeria on worst case scenario, and I'm sorry, madam. It's okay. <laughs> Whereby they've been in oil producing countries for more than 60 years. And what they've done over that period is to export crude oil to the US in the Gulf of Mexico, refine it there, and bring part of it into Nigeria. They've done that for 60 years. Thank God, Dangote has come unfortunately, in the green transitions, but it's finally come. In other words, the issue of natural resources within the continent, especially in the French zone, which is controlled by France, Niger get 10% of uranium if they're lucky. That is a magnet for foreign reserve. I think foreign reserve shouldn't be an issue if we are able to take full control of these resources across the entire value chains. I think that will help a lot. And if you look at Senegal, for instance, I'm so happy about what happened in Senegal, in part because we have this new regime, this new government, the people's president is taking over when they've discovered oil and gas. And how do we make sure that Senegal does not go the route of Nigeria, Gabon, Equatorial Guinea, but United Arab Emirates, or Norway, or the UK for the math for that matter. What BP has done to the UK has been remarkable in terms of reserve, in terms of resources. So I think it's very important for us as we reflect on the currency issue to integrate the issue of natural resource management, in part because when I look at the financial architecture, we are moving gradually but surely toward resource-based reserve currency. 
that's where the future is. And in that context, Africa is better place than any other regions, if and only if we are able to manage ownership and strengthen ownership of our resources. Thank you. Maybe just to add that, uh, if you look at the balance of payment data in the case of Niger, they receive more foreign earnings from exporting onion than from uranium. That's true. Think about it. Moi, mon inquiétude, c'est que eh, on a, nous, nous avons du temps de Samir Amin dans le cadre du Forum social mondial lancé l'appel de Bamako. L'appel de Bamako met l'accent sur eh, les leviers qu'il faut actionner justement pour sortir de cette impasse. Il y a les ressources naturelles, bien sûr, et ce dont le continent est immensément riche. Il y a les technologies que nous n'avons pas. Il y a le financement que nous n'avons pas. Il y a la communication. Mais mon inquiétude, eh, puisque j'ai le sentiment profond que le Mali n'est pas un pays eh, épicentre du djihadisme qu'il fallait aider. Le Mali a été agressé pour des raisons géopolitiques que nous connaissons tous maintenant. L'avantage qu'on a dans le contexte actuel, c'est l'éveil des consciences et on a gagné en compréhension des enjeux qui nous étaient cachés jusqu'ici. Maintenant, nous le savons. Mais nous devons également garder en mémoire le fait que les dominants ne lâcheront rien. C'est la question des rapports de force. La France a agi jusqu'ici de cette manière-là, dans l'impunité la plus totale. C'est pour ça qu'aujourd'hui, elle est choquée par le fait que des pays... Et quand on regarde les trois pays concernés, Mali, Burkina, Niger, ce n'est pas des pays qui comptent hein, par rapport au Sénégal et à la Côte d'Ivoire. Mais que ces pays puissent dire « France dégage », ça passe mal. Elle revient en force. Elle revient d'une manière ou d'une autre. Mais les États-Unis aussi veulent se maintenir puisqu'ils n'ont pas pu installer l'Africom. Quelque part, il faut qu'ils qu demeurent au Niger. Donc tout ce dont nous sommes en train de parler, c'est tout à fait légitime, c'est indispensable. C'est une question, il y va de la dignité du continent, on a compris, on ne peut pas rester dans cette situation. Mais seulement, jusqu'où ils vont aller C'est la question aujourd'hui. La résistance des peuples s'avère nécessaire. Je crois que les gens ne vont pas reculer, ils ont compris. Ils vont continuer à se défendre. Ils vont, bec et ongle, les gens voudront se défendre. Ou alors ils voudront émigrer. Or, on ne veut pas deux là-bas. Mais et la course est à l'armement et les, 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 et les dépenses considérables d'armement qui sont en train d'être faites aujourd'hui, ce n'est pas seulement entre eux et la Russie. Ça risque d'être aussi une guerre par procuration en Afrique. Et cela aussi, il faut l'intégrer dans notre réflexion sur la monnaie. Parce que si la monnaie est un moyen de domination, et si la monnaie contribue à la croissance, la paix et la sécurité chez eux, de la manière dont elle a fonctionné jusqu'ici, qu'est-ce qui nous dit que la France va savoir raison garder et, et céder d'une manière ou d'une autre Qu'est-ce qu'on va faire concrètement La question est d'une extrême gravité. Je suis désolé d'aller sur le terrain de la guerre parce que c'est la, la guerre économique. C'est la guerre économique. On est en, dedans depuis toujours. Maintenant, en touchant la question du, de la monnaie, nous touchons à la guerre économique et cela va se traduire par le recours à toutes ces, ces, ces tonnes d'armement de destruction. On ne sait pas si Macron va attaquer la Russie ou pas, mais ce qui se passe, et ensuite, au, au point où nous en sommes, l'Afrique doit intégrer cette dimension aussi dans la réflexion sur la sortie du franc CFA. Qu'est-ce que la France va vouloir faire Et quels sont, comment prendre le devant et Parce qu'ils n'ont peur que de leurs opinions. Les opinions plus publiques là-bas doivent savoir Qu'est-ce que tout cela nous a coûté S'ils ne veulent pas d'émigrés, ils ne veulent pas de noirs, parce qu'on est en train de dire tout ça, il y a, on en parlera. La dimension raciale, il y a une part de racisme dans tout ça. On peut se permettre d'infliger ces, 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 ces souffrances indicibles à certains peuples parce qu'on pense devoir et pouvoir les dominer ad vitam aeternam. C'est de cela que les jeunes générations ne veulent plus. Uh, we'll take uh, two more responses. 
uh, Mr. Zafar, and then Hippolyte, and then we'll go to the audience. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Listen, I just wanted to echo what Peter was saying, right? Tran currency transitions may be bumpy, but I believe they're necessary in many cases. Imagine if India and Ghana were still pegged to the British pound, right? So now the question is, how do you manage a currency transition successfully? There are cases in the world like DRC that have that or the dot that they try to have an independent currency, but they still are heavily dollarized. And the answer is simple, right? One is that you make a currency that reflects macroeconomics. The um, Africa CFA is no longer trading exclusively with Europe. So you make a currency that reflects a trade basket, as we said in the Africa Exim Bank, number one. Number two, you got to be opportunistic. We are in a world of swap lines. You look at Turkey and Egypt, they both got swap lines from the Saudis or from China. We are in a world of many sources of finance. Senegal could do a swap line with the US Fed. They could do a swap line with China. There's many, many macroeconomic solutions to the problem of reserves. And, um, you know, and once you get your currency to be more flexible, you can open up your monetary policy. You don't have to depend on the ECB. That's number two. Number three, I was very depressed when I wrote my book to realize the complicity of Francophone intellectuals. And me as an outsider was quite perturbed that in most parts of the world, intellectuals are nationalists. But in the Francophone world, they want to keep the old system, but the old system is not working. And so we need these Sahelian countries need a marketing department. They need a branding department. When Asimi Goita goes and reconquers Kidal, it should be front page news on the international newspapers but the intellectuals say there's chaos. So we have a problem. It's not only political and economic, it's the intellectuals in Francophone Africa that need to evolve. Thank you. <laughs> On that note, Mr. Hippolyte. <laughs> I mean, uh, Dr. Zafa, I suppose that the Silla is not part of that, uh, of that league, I suppose, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, I think he's perfectly right. And um, what he has not said is that when he was writing his book on the CFA, Frank, many African colleagues inside the World Bank did not provide him the support that he needed. In fact, they ran away from him <laughs> to so-called protect their career. So he's talking personal experience. I think African intellectuals have to understand that the future of the continent is more important than the BMW in Washington, D.C. <laughs> now, I think I'd like to come back to some of the very important points that Her Excellency made. And I think she talked about the proxy war as if we are not there yet. The proxy war is here. What is happening across Africa, in Sahel, in Sudan, in Mozambique, and so forth, are proxy war. And the data I saw two weeks ago, published by the Stockholm Institute on ARM, said that the US increased its export of ARM by more than 40%. It was quite significant. It was an amazing number. So they became, they were already number one, they established even a large gap between the number one and number two. And can you guess who was number two on that list? Can you guess? The number two on that list published by Stockholm Institute two weeks ago was France. France. So that is what is happening. When you look at military expenditure on budget in the Sahel countries, I don't even know how they are still growing, quite frankly. 
the last time I looked at Burkina, 45% military expenditure was the largest item in national budget. And for the US and France, it's growth enhancing. For us, it's growth crushing. It's humanitarian catastrophe in terms of lives and families. So that's on the military issue. I think you also raise a very important point, Excellency, on the racial dimensions of IMF and World Bank program. And a couple of years ago, the World Bank published the annual WDR, World Development Report. I think the one I liked the most was that one. It was actually led by a lady. It was the first time we had a lady director of WDR. There's one chapter in that WDR, I forgot the exact year. The chapter is so important. It's about how development intellectual, the biases of development intellectual or development professional, referring to the IM, the World Bank. The biases of development professional is a title. And the point they make is that they went through empirical tests and they realize that the policy recommended in Eastern Europe were different from the one implemented in Africa. And they would view that African country were more receptive of very harsh austerity measure than the one in Eastern Europe. So in excellency, in essence, what you are saying in terms of racial approach to development thinking is entrenched actually in these institutions. And then the issue of perception premium that we raised earlier, it is a real issue and it's affecting the continent significantly in terms of FDI, but also in terms of access to capital. In other words, when we had the COVID-19, it was a global crisis. No country was immune. Yet, rating agency decided to downgrade almost all African countries. Almost all of them. Including Gabon. On Gabon case, Moody wrote, it's because all price has collapsed and they wouldn't be able to sustain their fiscal balance or to honor their external liabilities. But when oil price came back a few weeks later, it was difficult for them to revise the rating of wood. And so that those rating agencies make that perception premium very high and make it very difficult for country to access financing. Think of it. Nigeria issued bond recently, uh, Kenya issued bond recently at more than 10%. What return on investment are you going to achieve with 10%? And that are to a problem and set the country and the continent on a debt trap, which makes matter even worse in terms of the fiscal space, because then you have to, the fiscal space constrained already by the IMF and the, the CFA Frank, is even more constrained because interest payment on external debt. So development becomes a secondary issue. So I, it's hard to believe that we're already at time, but I wanted to uh, make a couple of points. And then we had a, a question or two that came in via Zoom. And because those who are tuning in via Zoom don't have the benefit of just coming up to the individuals and speaking after, the, after this session wraps, I wanted to at least ask one of those questions uh, and then uh, ask, or have a question also from the audience here. And so before we go into the Q&A, just want to underscore the point that was brought up about the role of militarism, which is not separate from the economic circumstances that we're talking about. And in fact, is the tool that is used to create the, cer the, the circumstances that we're describing. And so when we look at the expansion of of AFRICOM and the billions of dollars that has gone into supporting military bases on the African continent, 
and in the United States case, but they're not working alone. They converse with their French counterparts. They converse with their counterparts in the UK to ensure that they have a collective strategy that they then uh, carry out or attempt to carry out on the continent. So we cannot underscore the role that militarism and military expansionism, particularly on the, on the continent plays. And then on the racial aspect or the racial component and this question of who is entitled to control the resources on the continent and perceptions or paternalism around Africans ability, capacity to actually control our own resources, right? Which is a product of the, um, we call it the lie of inferiority that has been pushed to justify why others should always be in control and making the decisions about the resources that we have. So that's just another point that I wanted to, to make sure we were clear on what it is that we're dealing with. And so with that, I want to, I know we have one internal question that I've been seeing, and then I want to ask one of the questions that have come online uh, for, and any of you will be able to respond to those questions. So uh, sir, if you could stand up and I think, And if you could please keep your question as brief as possible so that we can uh, get to the responses. My name is Rachel Gossi, is this clear? Um, it's not a question, it's uh, a comment of some sort. Um, we're talking, I think there's a, I'm okay. all right, <laughs> thanks. There, there's sort of a, um, uh, a convergence of, of ideas there that uh, there, is, uh, there are challenges around fiscal issues in the, in the CFA front. But have we considered banking, domestic banking, and the credit thereof to sidestep issues of foreign FDI and stuff like that? I think we can industrialize within the CFA franc. We can have better fiscal policy because fiscal policy should not be uh, restricted to just taxation and then the spending thereof. We can use domestic credit. Uh, so unless domestic credit in the CFA is restricted, I think there is a way in which we can um, uh, move forward. So can you give me a sense as to how the domestic credit uh, happens in the, in the region? Because banking is the vital element in this, in this game uh, of uh, you know, sustaining the, the the, the the region. Another question from inside, or do we? Have, yes. de ne pas être d'accord avec plusieurs points de vue qu'ont été émis. Euh, Permettez-moi de ne pas être d'accord avec certains des points de vue qui ont été émis ici euh, sur la question euh, de, de, la, de la fameuse transition. Premièrement, je considère que euh, le débat est mal parti, pas ici, mais quand je vois euh, les, euh, les trois pays sahéliens qui parlent une langue à propos du CFA, euh, le, les nouveaux dirigeants du Sénégal parlent une autre langue à propos du franc CFA, euh, les Ivoiriens ont une autre version, euh, etc. Ça me pose problème. Et il n'y a pas pire pour une monnaie que cette incertitude et cette absence de solidarité entre ceux-là même qui sont censés porter euh, la, euh, la, la nouvelle monnaie et qui sont censés donc, préparer la transition. Un. Deuxièmement, ici j'ai entendu des arguments de type euh, monétaire et financier. Macro, euh, quelqu'un a parlé, plusieurs ont parlé de la fiscalité et euh, des, des réserves monétaires, comme si c'était l'unique... Euh, problème ou euh, contrainte euh, à, à la transition euh, en question. Euh, 
Or, pour moi, euh, la, le véritable problème, il est économique et non pas seulement monétaire et, et fiscal. Il est économique dans le sens où, si on parle d'une monnaie future euh, qui doit être euh, celle de 16 pays ensemble, eh bien, on doit se poser la question des conditions économiques à mettre en œuvre pour aboutir à une monnaie fiable. Or, on ne parle pas de ça. Il y a lieu de, euh, de, de, de parler en termes de construction du marché intérieur ouest africain. Il y a lieu de parler des investissements nécessaires en termes d'infrastructures, en termes de, de, de politiques sectorielles nouvelles à mettre en place, en particulier industrielles et euh, agricoles, etc. Il y a lieu de parler euh, du, du statut de ces fameux ressources naturelles, euh, il y a, vraiment, et leur, leur lien avec euh, le reste de l'économie, pour ne pas rester euh, en situation d'économie euh, primaire, euh, tel que c'est le cas aujourd'hui. Euh, -ce, ça, ce sont les véritables conditions à mettre en œuvre pour avoir une monnaie forte. Deux, troisième problème, et je, je finis avec ça, euh, il y a des contradictions, des contradictions potentielles extrêmement importantes à l'intérieur même de la, de la zone CDAO. Si je considère euh, la Côte d'Ivoire d'un côté, euh, les pays sahéliens enclavés de l'autre, le Nigeria et le Ghana de, de l'autre, je considère que fondamentalement, ils n'ont pas les mêmes intérêts. Est-ce que euh, demain, on a vécu ça entre l'Allemagne et la France au moment de la mise en place de l'euro, est-ce que demain, la parité qui va être le, 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 la monnaie qui va être mise en place, elle aura une parité par rapport à l'euro et au dollar et aux monnaies fortes euh, mondiales euh, selon les règles et les contraintes imposées par le Nigeria Parce que le Nigeria, euh, il lui sera légitime de dire non, moi, je ne veux pas une monnaie très forte. Euh, Ou est-ce qu'on va euh, euh, plutôt respecter euh, le, la situation économique de la Côte d'Ivoire ou la, la situation économique des pays euh, sahéliens enclavés À quel niveau va se situer cette monnaie-là Or, il me semble que cette négociation interne à la CDAO fait partie intégrante de cette transition. Sinon, il ne peut pas y avoir de véritable solidarité dans cet ensemble. Merci. Do, does anyone want to, do you want to respond to us? So I have one, one question that I will uh, read to you that came from online. And the question is, why do, you, why do you think Western countries insist on democracy in African countries when it doesn't show results at all? And then I'm going to put this last question because it's related to what we were talking about earlier. Massive devaluation is pushing African countries into unsustainable external debt. So it is, is it a good strategy for all to champion its own currency, for everyone to champion their own currency? And those are the questions. I, I could take some, some of them. Uh, maybe briefly about uh, Taufik. The thing is, uh, sometimes you do not have the choice to do what is optimal because the choices, technical choices, are you know, somehow overdetermined by politics. What you are seeing is you know, what would be good in an ideal world. Take the case of Niger. Since uh, July 2023, the government has been cut off from its access to its own accounts at the Central Bank. And the government has been defaulting on its debt since then. And this has been orchestrated by the bank, Central Bank of West Africa under the guidance of France, the French Treasury. So all these countries, I will, they will never accept to be part you know, of a system where the actual ECOWAS is existing. This is not possible because this is politics. They, these three countries, they talk about existential threat and it's true because they were you know, imposed illegal sanctions illegal sanctions, totally illegal sanctions, and African countries accepted to do that. So that means uh, what we think as a solutions generally are determined by the politics, the actual politics. 
these countries, they will never, you know, take ECOWAS admits for decades to come as their main point of reference. They will just try to escape, you know, some harsh form of, you know, economic sanctions and etc. So exit is something to be done, but probably not in ideal conditions. About the role of the banking sector, we have to remind that uh, the, the banks, the central bank we have in West Africa, their origins come from, you know, uh, 90, 85 or 48, the abolition of slavery in France. You know, the slaveholders were compensated. They, they have, you know, the right, you know, to be compensated. And part of the compensation included, you know, uh, having, you know, uh, assets to create a central bank. The only central bank that was created was, uh, I mean, across the French empire was in Senegal. It was called the Bank du Senegal. And it was controlled by slaveholders and by the French company, the border French companies from Bordeaux. And uh, they, you know, controlled the credit system. And they did everything to, uh, I mean, to uh, create unfair competition with indigenous, you know, uh, companies, indigenous, you know, entrepreneurs, etc. That has been the origin of the system. Now, if we take, uh, you know, the current uh, uh, period, Senegal is one of the countries in the CFA franc zone where the ratio of you know, uh, credit to, to the private sector to GDP is one of the highest. You know. But this is an illusion. 75% of all bank credits have a maturity of less than one year, less than one year. And you know, more than, more than you know, 45%, they have a maturity of less than one month. You see, and the interest rates are, you know, two digits, despite, you know, the low level of so-called inflation, you see. And the other thing is that there is no credit at all from the banking sector to the agricultural sector, for example. If you take the case of Senegal, you know, uh, every year, the bank credit to the agricultural sector is 40, 40, 40, billion, 40 million euro, 40 million euro. The central bank itself grants twice this amount to its 3,000, you know, employees. That is, that is the CFA franc. So you don't have any, you know, independent uh, financial policy. Maybe Ali can add on that, on the, on the banking sector, actually, where essentially we have... Um, yes, on the question on banking, I think there's two problems. One is that the rules of the BCL and the BEAC are such that the capital requirements to set up a new bank are very high. So in most parts of developing world, you have many more banks, but they have very tight requirements and some of it is anti-competitive and, 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 and you know. The other thing is when I was doing the analysis, if you look at credit, to the private sector. CMAC, for example, is the worst in the world with less than 10%. If you compare Cameroon with Kenya, or you compare you know, Burkina with like South Africa, what you notice is huge gaps. And one of the reasons of that is the monetary financial repression. Because your money has to all go to protect the bank and you have very tight base CIO and BAC rules, you can't do financial intermediation. So your answer, the domestic credit is a flip side of the of the of the CFA zone. Once you open the CFA zone, domestic credit will flow. That's the first thing. Um je veux répondre en français à votre question. Um, 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 C'est vrai ce que vous dites, qu'il y a des chocs asymétriques dans une zone monétaire. Moi, personnellement, je ne, suis, je ne pense pas que le Nigeria et le Burkina doivent avoir la même monnaie parce que le, 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 Niger, le, le Nigeria est exportateur de pétrole, Burkina est importateur, mais... Vous pouvez avoir les trois pays sahéliens qui n'ont pas beaucoup de chocs asymétriques. Il y a un peu, mais on peut voir 
certain shows and commands. So il y a the formula pour, pour, pour la gestion de une zone monétaire. Vous voyez le euro, le, la Grèce et l'Italie dit, mais ce n'est pas. So, on peut trouver des solutions, moi je pense, à le choc asymétrique, mais, mais moi je pense la meilleure solution, les pays sahi sahéliens, um, personnellement, ils peuvent avoir leur monnaie et avoir en zone les trois pays. On peut discuter. So, so I want to focus, just pick up on one of your questions. I, th I thought you were dissatisfied with the diversity of conditions and options that the for a new currency, which appear to be out there. Some want their own currency. You want to have a a single currency to replace them. Let me talk a little bit about, say a few words about how the three should evaluate now, this is the, the three, the, 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 the destination, where, where should they be, how should they think about the options for their destination now? Just a few words about that. A point that's not been made, the main benefit of a joint currency for the three is mutual surveillance of each other's budgets. If they are going to join, form a joint currency, then that will require mutual surveillance of their budgets. And that could be a good thing, as I've already explained to you, that could be an essential ingredient for making the new currency work. Mutual surveillance of budgets does not mean deficits equal bad. Mutual surveillance can make a deficit's equal good credible. Okay. Now, there are lessons to learn from the euro area about how to design the mutual surveillance of the budgets. Most of the lessons are negative. The CFA Frank, if it is CFA folk, if they're going to form a joint currency, should not copy the mutual fiscal surveillance arrangements in the European euro area. Those clearly have major failures in their design. But some form of effective fiscal mutual surveillance is the core case for a single currency. The case against a single currency and going to instead to multiple currencies, some of the points have been made. You'd say, well, there's idiosyncrasies in the terms of trade shocks. There can also be different monetary preferences between the three that's separate from the, the, the trade shocks. They can just prefer different rates of inflation, different timings of things facing different constraints. And so monetary preferences can vary also. And if they do, that's a case for separate currencies. And the last factor we cannot overlook, going back to the military point, is that there are, there are governance uncertainties in the three because of the governance arrangements they presently have. And that can argue for separate currencies if they want to shield themselves from the governance uncertainties in their neighbors, all right? But whether or not the destination is a joint currency or three separate currencies, new monetary and financial supervisory arrangements will need to be built before launch. And the more complex the monetary arrangements that they choose, the more complex and demanding the technical skills required. That's a constraint you have to live in. And many facing such constraints have chosen the simplest form of monetary arrangement, such as a currency board, at least at an initial stage. But you have to respect those uh, technical constraints where they, where they arise. So I wanted to have uh, Madam Chayori respond to the democracy question, and then I think we'll have one more question from the audience, and then we'll wrap. Oui, la démocratie, si la démocratie va de pair avec le développement. Well, so the, the, so the question was why...
Bien sûr, au-delà au de, des États-Unis, je, si je prends l'exemple de mon pays, le Mali est, a été est le pays, l'exemple de démocratie dans les années 90. Nous, on était est, le bon élève est, est, de la démocratie. Et, et résultat des courses, voici là où nous en sommes aujourd'hui. Euh, je crois que c'est... Cette démocratie, en tout cas telle qu'elle nous est servie, telle qu'elle est exigée par la communauté internationale, n'a pas vocation à développer nos pays, ni même à faire de telle sorte que eh, les gens puissent vivre en paix. C'est devenu un fonds de commerce. Personne n'y croit. Tout le monde, les élus comme les électeurs, les électeurs attendent d'avoir, vous, vous le savez tous, tous nos pays, on vous distribue des pagnes, de l'argent, des calbasses, des casseroles, et c'est ça qu'on donne aux femmes. Et les élus savent que, et en allant, et pour, on, on va aux affaires, on va en politique pour faire des affaires. Donc, c'est au, au, au terme de ce processus, en tout cas au terme de ces quatre décennies d'essais de démocratisation, ce que moi je constate, c'est davantage d'inégalités, des inégalités monstres. Tout ce qu'on aurait pu gagner à travers eh, une démocratie eh, au contenu est clair, eh, de nature à transformer justement ce dont on parle ici, l'économie, les relations sociales et tout ça, ce n'est pas ça qui nous est servi. On revient encore à la question du narratif. Qui nous a parlé, qui nous a servi une démocratie qui, là, qui ne va pas dans le sens de nos intérêts, qui est un facteur de domination. No, thank you very much. I think I would like to, um, to take on a few questions, an issue that were raised. And I think if I take the first one on and add a few points on what um, Dr. Silla and uh, Ali have said on domestic credit. Not only we have a problem there, and at the national level, and another constraint faced by the African private sector is the fact that during the quantitative easing, foreign and European corporation in particular could actually access interest rates almost at 0% and invest within the continent and making it very difficult for African entrepreneurs to actually compete. That's why investing within the continent, in addition to the financial repressions, becomes so challenging. The second point that I'd like to make on the issue of CFA and development strategy, I think we learned a lot when the Russian crisis started And when European were about to put sanction on Russia and kick Russia out of SWIFT, there was a piece written by Wall Street bankers, essentially arguing against those sanctions. And one interesting argument they put forward is that doing that, kicking them out of SWIFT, will actually limit their visibility or investment or operation undertaken by Russia. And should other countries follow, it will become very difficult for them to know the strategy that China or Russia is contemplating. In other words, the issue of CFA franc and development strategy expose African country to extreme over-transparency, and which makes it very difficult to undertake strategic investment which could transform the continent. I think just for this argument, that should be enough to actually get out of it. I'm sorry for that. And then going back to the questions on devaluations and debt, it's important for us to look at what actually drive Africa debt, which by the way, it's in significance, quite frankly, as you speak, less than 2% of global sovereign debt. But the real issue driving that debt, there are at least two or three components. The first one is the fact that these debt is all, are always triggered by structural current account deficit, which send this country to raise debt to cover those imbalances. 
So unless we diversify African economies to capture more value along the value additions, that will remain a permanent problem. The second thing is, since the asymmetry of reserve issuance is a privilege of the few, as they move interest rates, whether African countries are part of it or not, in fact, one famous US Secretary of Treasury said, the dollar is our currency and it's your problems. In other words, when they move the interest rate, we have massive capital flight out of the continent, which weaken African currency. It's not just Nigeria, uh, it's the Ethiopian, the, 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 Egyptian, the Egyptian pound has collapsed completely. And so has maybe the, the currency in, in Ethiopia and many other countries over here. So that depreciations make it even more difficult to honor the interest on external liability and domestic currency. Now we're talking at costing Nigeria 40% of the budget now is to finance internal debt, external debt. And so we have that combination of Fed monetary policy and the fact that we are exposed to recurrent adverse terms of trade shocks. And then the third thing, which is even more insidious, is what they call the original sin of issuing debt in foreign currency. And currently, as we speak, 95% of bond issues by African countries are in foreign currency with 72% in US dollars. So as the dollar strengthened in 2023, countries were exposed to currency risk, which is the crisis we're talking about as we speak now. And, and finally, to go back to the point made by you and maybe even Peter, I think it's important for us to be mindful of the fact that the current sitting is first and foremost a political issue. And the constraint that Greece faced after the financial crisis was due to the absence of fiscal federalism, essentially. I think Paul Krugman wrote something about this. And that absence of fiscal federalism made it very difficult for countries at different stages of development to actually coexist. But in the US, where we spend some time, a lot of time actually, I've been to Mississippi. Mississippi has nothing to do with Vermont or Connecticut. It's the poorest state in the continent in the Union with very high poverty rates. But the fiscal federalism has enabled this state to coexist. So it's very important and it's a leverage that we shouldn't really uh, neglect as we think about the future of Africa on the monetary arena. Thank you very much. Can we, can we give a round of applause to our panelists? So I know we had one, we had another question, but it is, it doesn't feel like it. And it's been two hours plus already. And we also want to honor the time and those who are who work in the space, who are providing the refreshments and the sound and all of that um, to make sure that we're not here too late. So we're going to wrap this part of the panel discussion, but I want to encourage you since you all are here in person, you can actually just ask folks your questions directly. Um, but I do want to take a moment to really just thank all of our speakers, our panelists, for your insights and for um, just giving us so much to think about and so much to take away, even as we go into the rest of the conference this week. So I want to, to, to thank you and show gratitude for you again to Ideas and to Afrodad and the governments of Ghana as the organizers of this conference uh, and creating the space for us to have these discussions and debates. Uh, and finally, I want to remind everyone again that there are refreshments that have been provided in the lobby area. So please feel free to partake and to engage with each other as well as the panelists there. And can we just give one last round of applause for not only the speakers, but for our technicians, our tech team, our camera people, and all of the workers who have helped to pull this together. Thank you so much.
Oh, oh yes. And for our closing remark to make, to make sure that we send you off well, we wanted to, <laughs> we wanted to have Her Excellency to, to close us out with some final remarks. Closing remark. Je pense que c'est on a avancé en deux heures de temps. On a touché à des questions essentielles. On a progressé. Je crois que c'est la question est d'une telle complexité que il s'agit vraiment de d'approfondir la réflexion. Mais je crois que rien que par votre présence ici, on convient que c'est une question d'une importance capitale, et à la fois pour les pays concernés, les peuples concernés et les relations entre eh, nations. Nation. On y croit, j'espère qu'on eh, on pourra enterrer un jour euh, le franc CFA et que l'Afrique survivra à cela. Merci.